okay so we're recording as well um so first of all good evening and thank you for joining me it's obviously a difficult day for the kehila difficult day for all of you please mute everybody please everybody could mute their mic thank you really was only a few short days ago we were all sitting together on the floor and crying and we and we all thought i thought that the crying for this year is over now we will move in mirz hashem and we'll start sharing simchas hashem thought otherwise Night, the 15th day of Av, Tuba Av, and the Mishnah says, Loi hoyu yomim toivim bi Yisrael. No better day is for Klal Yisrael. Tonight should be an absolute yomta for Klal Yisrael, however we understand what Tuba Av is, but unfortunately, it certainly doesn't feel like a yomta. Although I've just been, I came back from Berlin yesterday evening, and the idea was to come back for one week to the final push. To, I'm surrounded. It's a good job you can't see the mess. I'm surrounded by dozens and dozens of boxes. We're getting the final, getting everything together, cancelling the last few insurances <laughs> and doing everything we need to do. I was meant to be here for about a week so that we could. Um, instead, Raquel and I are getting on a plane tomorrow morning. We have a taxi coming at half past four so that we're with you for Shabbos. Sunday, and we'll go back again, come back again on Monday. Just to be there, just to be there with you. Let's just take a few minutes, begin to get some sort of perspective. I must say how proud I was. I had the zuchus of having a Zoom meeting with Emma's class this morning. We spoke and we shared experiences and what they were thinking and what they were feeling. And I gave them, I hope, a bit of support, a bit of guidance for about an hour. And I was blown away by some of the comments they made, their maturity. David Lefkovich, who's by mitzvah, it is this Shabbos, said that he feels. On the one hand, this is the highest point of his life. This is clearly the lowest point of Emma's life. And that maturity, the ability to think about somebody else's world was very impressive. And I forget who the, I don't have my notes here. I think, if I'm not mistaken, maybe it was Miriam Lubarsky. Does that, that right? The classmate who was one of the girls who knew before Emma that Esther we, from now on, we do call her Esther and not Esther Tehillah, by the way, because she didn't recover. So we revert back to the original name just of Esther. Emma did not know yet. Her classmate did know. And she played along and she acted because she realized that Emma needs to hear from Yoel her father she played along she had the strength of character there's a maturity that teenagers don't normally possess we should be rightly proud of our children it was very special this Shabbos known as Shabbos Nachamu after the Haftorah we read the words of Yeshaya where Hashem after tragedy Turns around to us and says, Nachamu, Nachamu Ami, be comforted, my people. But it's a double expression, be comforted. The truth is, it doesn't mean comfort, really. Let's drill down a little bit. And I, I do want to give you about 10 minutes or so, maybe 15 minutes of some Torah. Share a few. Wait, 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 I ask everybody please to mute your mics there, so that everybody doesn't hear you. There are 43 people on the line and Please mute your mics. Thank you so much. 
play with you a bit of Torah and then we'll do a little bit of interactive as well. We say in Kaddish, Le'ela mikol berchosa v'shirosa, u'shbechosa v'nechemosa. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is above all razors. Now that we understand. What does it mean when we say he is above mikol nechemosa? He is above all comfort? What does that mean? Let me share with you a story, a true story, a very powerful story. And I will introduce it just by saying that the real meaning of the word nechama means to have the strength and the ability to look at the same set of facts, draw a totally different conclusion. That's what nechama really means. That's the art. Is the challenge of giving somebody nechama? We'll talk more about how one does that. Very often things happen in our lives and we're challenged by them and we don't understand them. And I, I will say right from the start, before we go any further, I think there will be occasion, Emir Hashem, over the weeks to come and the months to come, as I said on Tisha B'Av, we can do Torah, we can do philosophy. Not tonight. Not now. Now is not the time. Over 20 years ago, well, it's more, remember it, 91, you all remember the, the Iraqi war. The scuds were falling, Eretz Yisrael. There was a Friday night and the scuds were all around and Siren went in the famous Lederman Shul, where the Chazanish, where the Steipler, where Abchaim Kanievsky Davins. And the sirens went in the middle of Shemayna Esra, middle of the Amida. Everybody immediately, correctly, halachically interrupted the Shemayna Esra and went straight downstairs to the Miklat. Except for one young Talmud Chacham. Whether or not he acted correctly halachically is not, not the point. But he was then asked, why did you not interrupt your Shemena Esra? So he said as follows. He said, what better possible way could there be to die in the middle of Shemena Esra, in the middle of speaking to God and speaking to Hashem and going straight from there, standing right in his presence? An incredibly powerful insight. And that in itself would be an unbelievable story. I missed out one very important thing. The name of that Talmud Chacham, some of you might recognize. His name was Rav Moshe Tversky Shem Yinkem Domoy. Over 20 years later, on the 25th of Mar Cheshvan, 5775 in Harnoff, he was standing in the middle of Shemayn Estra, and that's how he gave his life back to the Rabbeinu Shalom in the Haranoff massacre. Same person. Thank you. And please, everybody, please mute your mic. Thank you. It's all about perspective. That's what this is about. When the Beis Hamikdosh was destroyed, first Beis Hamikdosh was destroyed. When we had Nevi'im, we had prophets. We had people... Achomim, Nevi'im. The Novi asks the question, Alma of the Ha'oretz, why did we lose the land? How could we have sunk so low? Lose Beis Hamikdosh. The Gemara says they ask the Nevi'im, they ask the prophets, they ask the Chachomim, the wise people, and nobody knew. Nobody knew. Until Sheba HaKadosh Baruch Hu, until the Rabbeinu Shalom himself. Aim and he answered, Shalei Baruch Hu Batei Rabchila. Rabbeinu Shalei answered the question. Nobody else. Rab Shach, Zechreinu Levracha, asks the following obvious question. He says, if the Nevi'im, the Prophet, sorry, just a second. I'm really sorry, people have just walked into my house. This is how it goes here. It's my, I'm talking. 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 I'm tal
לא, אני, אני עכשיו באמצע, יש לי 50 אנשים, אני באמצע שיעור, אני מת... מת... אז תבוא בבקשה. בבקשה, תבוא בחזרה בעוד שעה. בבקשה. תודה. 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 זה הדבר שעובד. We'll still put Berlin on the map. We'll know when it'll be on the map when we, <laughs> when we get disturbed in the middle of a shit. It's my fault Raquel is out and I didn't lock the door. So, where was I? Asked Reb Shach, obvious question. How can it be there for? Prophets didn't know. Chachomim didn't know. Then how can we be held guilty? How can we be held liable for something that was so hidden? His answer is shocking profound. My friends, we know. When it comes to your life, others may not know really what's going on in your life behind your closed doors. And even people can be Nevi'im and Chachomim and they perhaps they don't know. We know. Every individual knows in their own lives. And it is therefore required of them to realize where and how they can improve. That's a very telling lesson. That word nechama, the ability to look at the same set of facts and draw the opposite conclusion. Parashas Bereshis. HaKadosh Baruch Hu looks around at mankind and he says, mankind is no good. People just have evil thoughts and I'm going, I'm going to wipe them out. And he brings the mabul, as we know, he brings the flood. And then Noach comes out of the Teva and he brings a korban to Hashem. He brings a sacrifice. And then the most unbelievable thing happens. Hashem smells, Vayorach esreach and ichoyach, whatever that means. He says, Loi oisif oid lekaleles ho'adomo avur ho'adom. I will no longer ever do this again. Do you know why? Because man is evil. He ate sir, leiv ho'adom ram in urov. That means the same set of facts. Upon which Hashem made a decision, destroy, he now used the same set of facts not to destroy. That's Nechama. Nechama is the ability, and this is our challenge now before we go any further. The world has been shaken, and quite rightly. And this is the first thing, by the way, I said to the children this morning to reassure them. This is not normal. Normal people, normal people. We have an expectation the vast majority of people live long and healthy lives. Or Hashem. The first thing I needed to reassure them was, Dimitz Hashem, they will have long and healthy lives. They needed reassurance and we need this reassurance. This is not normal. The fact that we're having this shir, it is because this is not the norm. Or Hashem. Nechama is, now that our world has been shaken, is the ability to look at the same facts, to get up and have the, the courage. Look at our spouses, to look at our children. Look at the same situations to draw a different conclusion and to have different Maybe we, we have challenges with relationships. We all do. Nechama is the ability to look at the same things, nothing has changed, and to draw opposite conclusions, to cherish our spouses, our parents, our children, to give them a hug, realize how precious they are. It's sometimes only when we lose something. It is an opportunity. It's a difficult one, and we don't ask for it. For Altivienu loyli deni soyon. Now that it's here, we are called upon to rise to that challenge and to create Nechama, to view everything in our lives now from a fresh lens, from a different way of looking at things. We're being challenged and we're being challenged as a Kehillah. I want to tell, share with you a personal story, two personal stories, if I may. One of them I shared with the teachers in the Vorbereitungswoche last week. One of them I shared with the children in school today. They both 
involve our experiences in Gibraltar and they were both very powerful and I think there are massive lessons from them. We, I got married in 1988 and literally three months after we got married, we moved to Gibraltar to become part of a coelom there. It was interesting, very different. And we were six young families in the middle. There was no, you have to understand there was no mobile phones. There was no coffee. We came into the shul after Bacharis and we set up the tables and put our gemaras on them and we learned. The mobile phones really didn't exist yet. <laughs> it makes me sound awfully old. It was a very, very different world. And not that long after we were there, one morning, little Tova Ebbing, nine months old, just didn't wake up. Cop F S I D S, whatever they call it. A short while after that, one of the little wives Friday night lit the candle. Something went wrong. I don't know what happened. The whole house caught fire and they escaped with their lives, with their clothes into the street. And we were a young, I was 22. We were very young. We were shaken. Very shaken. And we asked my Rebbe, Rebbe Matisio Salomon Schlitter, some of you may have heard of him, and then he was young, he was fiery, he was powerful. And he came, he was the Mashkiach of Gate City Shiva, he came over and he gave us all chizuk and he said the following story. He said there were two, he really posed the following question. He said, sometimes when things happen to us in our lives, we sometimes take it as a message of some sort. You're doing something perhaps that's no good, perhaps we need to improve. And then sometimes when things happen in our lives, perhaps we're meant to ignore them. How do we know? He said the following two stories from the Chofetz Chaim. I'll keep it short because I'm going to run out of time very quickly. There were two incidents in the Chofetz Chaim's life when tragedies happened. One was when he was thinking of making Aliyah and going to Eretz Yisrael. And the other one, when his son-in-law died tragically very young, straight not long after he started writing the Mishnah Brura. On one occasion, when he, wasn't, when he was about to make Aliyah, he took that as a sign in Ashramayim that he shouldn't go to Eretz Yisrael, and so he didn't. And on the other occasion, he totally ignored it, and he went straight ahead and continued writing, publishing. Uh writing and publishing the Mishnah Burra. His Talmudim asked him, how does one know in one's life when to take something oh. as a sign? Please, please, whoever that is, please everybody mute your mics. Thank you so much. How do we know? And he said as follows. He said, when the Chofetz Chaim was thinking of going to Eretz Yisrael, he hadn't quite decided yet. He was weighing up the pros and the cons and he himself wasn't, wasn't sure. That's at the forehead. Can you please, please, everybody, please, we can hear you. Please mute your mic. Thank you so much. When he hadn't quite made up his mind, he took it as a simon min ashramayim, and he didn't go to Eretz Yisrael. On the other occasion, he had thought about it, and he decided Klal Yisrael needs the Mishnah Brura, and he started writing it. Then when his son-in-law died young, he said that is the Satan Trying test him. He ignored it. And I will never forget that Matisio Salomon Schlito was a strong, powerful character. He said the Koilal in Gibraltar, the good and important thing, Gedolim have been asked about it, it is the right thing. This is the Sotan trying to test you. He banged on the table and he screamed, Satan Gnug! Enough, we're not going to listen to you! And I say to you, the Kahila, your Kahila, our Kahila, the good thing, it's a necessary thing. Satan, you're not going to dissuade us. have a group of people here who've given up so much. Yiddishkeit, 
we have a Kailal now, we have a Rabbina seminar, we have the opportunity, as I mentioned on Tisha B'Av, and now you have a Rav, better or for worse. We can hopefully bring it all together. Satan Ganog, it's not going to help. We're not going to be dissuaded. And now we turn to the second story that happened in Gibraltar. And here we begin, there's plenty much more Torah to say, but now I'm going to begin to be a little bit more practical and take some questions shortly. I want to tell you the second story. And that is, I think the school, the Lauda Shula is small in Gibraltar. At the time, it was much smaller. Jewish primary school, the Talmud Torah, and my daughter, Mary, who you haven't met yet, has got five kids of her own, Baruch Hashem, though she was, I think, seven. I think there was one or perhaps two other girls in the class. It was a tiny class, and her best friend was Daniela Atias, seven-year-old girls. I remember coming into Shachris one morning, and there was a big emotion, confusion. They said that Daniela's mother, Sonia, didn't wake up that morning. She was 32 years old. No illness, nothing. And you have to understand the Gibraltarian mentality. They're very warm. They're very loud. They are like the Latin American mentality. They're always kissing each other and, and shouting. And, and Jimmy, the husband, was distraught beyond... He said the following. He said, people will come to the shiva. He says, I don't want to talk. There's nothing to be said, he said. I want everybody there, but I don't want there to be any talking. You know, Simon and Garfunkel's song, The Sound of Silence. One of the most powerful experiences in my life. The packed shiva room from morning night for a week when not a single word was said. He was surrounded by a wall of love. And everybody was just there with him. Empathy, not sympathy. I don't know how to say that in German. I should have looked it up. Empathy, not sympathy. Therefore the halacha is when one goes to a shiva, the oval is in the driving seat. They decide whether they want to talk, whether they don't want to talk. And sometimes when we go to a shiva, we feel uncomfortable ourselves. And I've seen some horrific things. People who are so uncomfortable, they begin to pull up pictures of their grandchildren and talk about them and the weather. And the, there is nothing more horrific. This is an opportunity for us to be there for Yoel, for Emma, for Aaron, to think about what's going on in their world. Just be there for them and with them. They're not objects of pity. Nobody wants to be a nebuch. This is an opportunity for us, all of us, Gather as a kahila to think about what's going on in their world and what, how we can just be there with them. And that's really why we're coming on Shabbos to be, to be there with you. This morning in the Zoom meeting that we had, I don't know if any, all of you know, Oliver Erhorn was there as well. And in the middle, he said something credible said and he shared he said when he was because i asked went around the room i asked everybody to share something what they were thinking what they were feeling and he piped up he said when he was 18 he lost his mother and he said he didn't have an opportunity to sit with friends and to get support he said to the children you don't know how lucky you are we were all just sitting around Mora Hyman, Rokhanovsky, Fabian, 
the children, we're just sharing, thinking about how we can be together for and with the Avelim. This is an opportunity. It's not an easy one. It's a real chizuk. Nechama, as I said, is about the ability to look at the same set of facts. That's why I'm, tonight we're not, like I said, tonight is not the time to talk about the problem of evil and suffering. It's not what this is about. This is about challenging us how we can think about getting entering into their world. It's a very private world. Many of you not even know Esther was ill. Very private people. They didn't want others to know. We need to respect that. We need to think about what can we do as a Kahila, as friends, whether you were close to them or not, just to be there with them and for them. I have so much more to say. I think for the moment, and I don't know exactly how this is going to work because we have 47 people online, and if everybody just um, shouts out, maybe we could use the, um, the chat facility. Um, there is a chat facility. You can, you can type, you can type comments. Uh, maybe, and I, and I, I can't even see everybody as well, but if there is, if somebody maybe, maybe that is there wants to either put their hand up or a chat, let's see whether this works. I, this is the first time I've done this, so I don't know. Um, ah. So Joel is asking, thank you. I did this already with the children. And this is another thing, by the way. Yes, sorry. Thank you for, uh, uh, for mentioning this, Joel. That's very good. When I spoke to the children, children particularly, can be traumatized. The first thing, our first chiyuv, our first obligation as parents, we are adults. If we are shocked, imagine what's going on in their, in their world. And I think on Shabbos, we will, Raquel and I, hopefully we'll find opportunities. We're thinking about how to do that, of actually spending time with some of the children. And I must tell you, I was very impressed with children today. I really was impressed. Started writing letters to her. I told them about writing the letter is about not, this is not your opportunity to offload. Maybe there's two letters that need to be written. There's thinking about what works for her. Therefore, before we even get to the shiva, the first point is that children need and deserve a safe environment. They need to feel reassured. For some of them, it will be physical. More hugs, just be there for them, tactile, depending on the kid. They may have questions, encourage them to share. Not if, you have to know your own children. There is no hard and fast rule. Some children need prodding and encouraging to come out of their shell and share. Others will come out with it anyway. There's no such thing as a good or a bad question. It's all legitimate. You answer the question and not the questioner. The other way around, sorry. You answer the questioner. What are they really saying? Now you know your children. So therefore, as far as the shiver is concerned, it is my view, I think, that Emma should have friends with her in the shiver. Levi is a different story. And spoken to some of the parents already about that. We must not do anything. Our children come first. We may not do anything that will, which they can't handle, which may traumatize them. Um, during the shiver, again, depending on how Emma is, and I believe she's quite a sensitive, I don't know her, I believe she's quite a sensitive child. And I mean, therefore, really has to, we have to take the lead from, from her. Some, for some, it just means sitting there and being with them. And it's about talking to your children about the, the like I said, this is not normal. You need reassurance more than anything else. No, not to be hysterical in any way. This is not a normal thing. This does not happen every Monday and Thursday at all. The vast majority of people live long and healthy lives. At the same time, now that it's happened, it challenges us to grow. Speak about how that could do and encourage conversation. So that, I think, in broad terms, that is, the, uh, that is some, some advice. Um, if anybody, uh, maybe we should do it this way. If somebody wants to, to text, it would be easier because once people start talking, I think if everybody starts talking, there's no way anybody will get heard. So if there are any specific questions, maybe um, want to, a type, and I can see that, I can see the 
questions immediately. I don't know what, uh, what the way of handling this. This is new to me as well. I had to actually even upgrade my Zoom because it would only in order to handle larger group of people. So I'm a novice at this. Uh, yes, Aaron, I presume somebody, I, I presume everybody can see all, all, all the chat. Um, okay, somebody's helping me out here. Thank you. On the more ab, right corner on the hand there is an option to raise hand ah thank you i did not know that let's see where is more speaker view sorry one second i don't see more what have i just done one second please uh speaker view where does it say more uh all i can see is speaker view or there is a i can't see more sorry No, anybody wants to help me out here if you can see the where the more thing is can't i can see more of you now though okay so does anybody want to raise their hand or ask and we'll so let's see whether it works we can try how to be menachem aaron okay Again, I've seen Aaron in shul a number of times. I don't really know him well, is the truth. Um, in, in many respects, look, this is not about, I mean, let's be clear. This is not about answers. This is not about philosophical questions and answers. That's not what this is about. Nechama, about one thing and one thing only. Demonstrating to the other person a very real way you care about them. That's all it's about. It's not a philosophical exercise. In fact, it would be wrong and cruel and insensitive. I don't care how from a person is. There's a time. There's a time to philosophize. There's a time to, to think. There is a time just to be there for the other person. And that is what Nahama is. Ah, somebody has raised their hand. Where have they gone? Sorry. Do it again. You've gone. Top right corner, unmute, start video, share. Oh, sorry, guys, I'm really apologize. With me, top right corner, unmute, start video, share. Contents, participants, what's not in mind. Take a view. Oh, this is annoying. I'm sorry. I don't appear to have that. I'm sorry, whoever raised their hand, would they like to, to, to speak, please? What can we as a community do to help them now? The first and most obvious thing is, is to be sensitive to their wishes, to who they are as a family, not to project or impose my family dynamic. I would want on them. Therefore, really those that know who they are to tread sensitively and carefully um on that the obvious practical stuff which is you know the cooking and the it's about being responsive to what girl the kids want and appreciate that is the that is the, that is the key thing that is the rule of thumb this is not about you this is about this is about them. And, and therefore, when one goes there, the last thing you do is, if I may, please forgive me, the last thing you do is share something that has happened to you. What I've just done with you now is to you. You know what's appropriate? I'll tell you what's appropriate. Shiva. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you another story. When I was 14, we were talking before of Matisseau Salomon. His nephew was a, in my, he was in the class above me in school, and one morning when he, he was 14, he didn't wake up. Shmuley Salomon 
all of our shalom. Just didn't wake up. That was a massive tragedy, 14 years old. And everybody went to the shiver. It was, you can imagine, and Gates said it was a massive tragedy. My father, I learned something from my father. My father, to this day, when he sees Susie, the mother, the father's no longer alive, talked to her about Shmuley. When somebody is part of your life, they don't just disappear. We know, ask about Esther. We didn't know her that well. Without crying, some people have sensitive aspects to their background, obviously sensitive. Asking about her, who was she? What made her tick? What was going on in her world? Speak about her. Speak about the family, the impact. This is, has nothing whatsoever to do with you, your experiences. It's about just being there for them and sharing with them, thinking about what would they want to speak about or indeed not speak and sitting, sometimes sitting in silence. Just being there with the person, depending on how appropriate it is, holding their hand or without going into the halachic shilas. Two types of shiva. There are those that go and just, I'm here and I'm projecting my, my life, my experiences, my... And there's the other person who's just reflective. A beautiful line that I heard a long time ago, and I try and put it into practice every day. I don't always succeed. So this should be a fridge magnet. This is immense. If you get this, it, it, I think it changed my life in a bit. There is a massive difference between listening and waiting to speak. That's the line. That's it. When do we listen? And when do we wait to speak? Listening means receptive. I'm not projecting any of myself onto you or the situation. Listening. It's not just orally, it's, it's everything. I'm just there. I'm just there. I'm present. And I'm there for you. Nothing else. You don't have to speak. How many times in a conversation do we actually, we're not listening, we're waiting to speak. When will the other idiot finish? And then I'll say my brilliant, witty thing that I have to say. <laughs> I'll get, and really lost opportunity. Listening is... When somebody else is speaking, they're letting you into their world. If he wants to speak, we speak. If he doesn't, we don't. There's no hard and fast rule. The halacha does something very brilliant, and very powerful. It puts the oval in the driver's seat psychologically. We do not speak until we're spoken to. And when we do speak, we think about what would what's going on in their world. We can't know and we don't sympathize. Nobody wants to be an object of pity, as I said before. It's about empathy. It's just about being there with them in the moment totally. Talk about anybody, you talk about Esther. You inquire, be curious. Maybe some of us didn't know her that well. No greater nechama than when people they want to talk about their loved ones. They had a life with a spouse, with a mother. And there's an immense, there's an immense void. There's a, there's, a, there's a void in their lives now. That's gone. It's a reality. It's still a reality for them. We don't avoid it. We overcome our own embarrassment, our own difficulty, and we, we think about them. That's the rule of thumb. If we go along with that rule of thumb, yeah. then we can do real nechama and we can... We can connect to them. And that's an incredible, incredible experience. And we all grow from that. And to make it a drop broader and wider, that it's actually not just it's about them, of course. It's also about those that were close to them. How has it impacted them? Maybe flat families that were close, maybe giving, giving them a call. They must have been a really difficult day for you. How are you? I just wanted to say how. Text. This is an opportunity for us to be more than just a group of individuals, to be a hiller. 
we shouldn't need this sort of challenge, this sort of experience, but that's the reality. That is the challenge, and we become closer as a result of it. And there's a bar mitzvah Shabbat as well. Let's think about that. How do I balance? Shaloita heit sara v'yogain v'anocha b'yomenu chaseinu. Once had in my kahila in, in, in Edgeware, we had a, a mother, remember she was an asthmatic, she was 50 something, she couldn't get to her inhaler in time, which was literally error of sukkahs. We went, went to bury her in my Yom Tov Begodim, we came back, there was 20 minutes, it was late 20 minutes after the Kvura, Mariv, and sukkahs, Zman Sim Choseinu. The husband and the children were in shul 10 minutes later in their big day on Zman Sim Choseinu. And I spoke about how Simcha is an Avoida. You have to think of others. David Orlos, David um, has a bar mitzvah this week. How do we balance conflicting emotions? It's okay to be sad, it's okay to grieve, and everything has a time and a place, and we do it appropriately. We're able to do that. We grow from that. And our children see that, and they're looking to us, looking to us for guidance, for support, for leadership. I just had, a, sorry, I just had another comment. I just wanted to, um, yes, and at the risk of stating the absolute obvious, under no circumstances mm -hmm. we we're not God, you not me certainly. And sometimes I, 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 to me, I thought it was just so obvious, but one has to sometimes state the obvious. I mentioned it a little bit on Tishabov, if some of you remember. Say, or to even to think, it is would be forgive me, it would be presumptuous and arrogant and wrong at every level to play the from card. X happens because of Y. I'm sure nobody would do that. That would be so wrong and so arrogant and so cruel at every level. We don't know. We're not the Rabbeinu Shalom. He knows. We don't know. Small children, that's a very good question. Somebody's asked, what about small children? Okay. Truth is, this is something that I'd like to I spoke to Moshe Halpin earlier about this. This is something that is really necessary, and we did this in Edgeway. Unfortunately, we had more than one occasion to do this. The truth is, could be, not only could be, we very likely do need to bring in the services of a professional bereavement counsellor. There are people from people or from organizations who specialize in this, and especially for children. That's something that we need to do to support. I can give you some tools. I've done this as a talk with some with some parents, and I was I've attended child support bereavement groups, and they're not pleasant things. There are a couple of very very simple things you can do. I'm just going to give you one little tool for the very for the relatively young. And I'd have to dig out my notes and think again. And again, it always has to be age appropriate the other thing and it needs to be supportive if a kid is traumatized it's about it's not really again they're not philosophical when a kid says why when a four-year-old kid says why he doesn't mean the problem of theodicy and you know voltaire's candide and the the he doesn't doesn't mean that doesn't know what these things mean that's not what he means but again quick story the Moshal. It's, it's a really important one. The story is told of a 14-year-old a, a girl, an intelligent girl, or a 13-year-old intelligent girl or boy who comes home one day and mummy and daddy sit her down and they say, we, we've got to tell you something. And this, she says, what is that? They said, well, look, no, unfortunately, we're getting divorced. And the girl says, why? The father says, oh, that's actually quite easy to explain. You see, we fell in love when we were 19 and thing, and we didn't really think it through. We've you know, grown older and we just realized we're different. We share very little in common. We have different interests. And I love, I like your mother. I think she's a lovely person and she likes me. There's no anger. There's no bitterness. We just want different things and I want her to be happy and she wants me to be happy. So we're going to go off and do different things and you can be 
It's still the center of our world and you can stay with me, you can stay with mommy, you can do whatever you want. Will the child say, thank you, and then just toddle off to their room and read their book or play the computer game? Of course not. Why not? He asked a question why and was given a precise, true answer. So why doesn't she say, why won't she, why won't she be happy? The answer is because the why was never an intellectual why. It was an anguished cry from the depths of her being. Her, war, her world has just fallen apart. I once saw an art, a, a headline of the, the, Jewish, the late Jewish Observer, brilliant title, Two X's, the Y. If you get the subtlety of that. When our children are asking why, depending on what age they are, they don't mean how could a how can we reconcile a kind and just God with the problem of evil and so shaken. That's what it means. It's an emotional question, and an emotional question needs emotional response, even if it is masquerading as an intellectual question. That does not mean. Some of them will not have some sort of intellectual component of it. And here I'll give you maybe, and again, it will be age appropriate for some, not for others. I've used this myself in talks in primary schools here in London. This is right for about the age maybe of seven, eight, perhaps. Again, each child, some children are, are much more um, aware. And I used to talk about a, um, you know, an astronaut, a spaceman. So we have, when you see the pictures of a spaceman, I'll show them a picture of a spaceman. So you can't see the face, you can't see, what do you see? You see this old fish bowl on top of their head and you see this weird plastic suit. And then you show them a picture of the astronaut or maybe a little video of them getting into the space suit. And you explain to them, of course, that inside that suit, there is a human being. And that on the outside is just the suit, just the clothes. And depending on how how old they are or how intelligent they are, we introduce, they know the concept of Hashem, who is a reality and exists, but even though we can't see him, we have a neshama. We have something inside of us that makes us alive. Therefore, really, our body, just like a suit, and houses us for however many years, Again, this has to be age appropriate. And for some kids, it works amazingly. For eight-year-olds, this very, very well, in my experience. Therefore, the neshama lives on. It's reassuring in one sense. The person is still there, but not... The suit has gone. The neshama is with Hashem, and it's warm, and it's loved, and it's supported. It doesn't, we're not turning it into a happy event. The, the others are family are sad of course mm -hmm. and that is appropriate it's about balancing those conflicting emotions that's just one simple pointer and that can be elaborated upon but again i'm i'm not an expert we i think we need to think seriously about potentially bringing in certainly for the children depending on how widespread the trauma might be and when i get there i'll assess it and i encourage everybody please to be in touch um see whether we, perhaps we do need to bring in a professional, um, preferably Jewish or from uh, um, a therapist for, for child bereavement. And for adults as well, you know, it's, at the moment it's, it's a time, like I said, really just to be strong and to be with, with and for the family. Okay, are there any other, any other questions? I think at least the, the I don't seem to have the hang of the Hands up thing for some reason. I apologize. So if there is, uh, if there are any other, somebody wants to type, if there is anything, otherwise I think I will see you. Shabbos, Simeon, Sashem, and um, we, 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 we're planning on staying till Monday afternoon. And then uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll just be there for each other. Just be there for each other. This is a Shabbos. Shabbos, we can. Shabbos is still Shabbos. Shabbos is, is Simcha. Shabbos is, perish your family. 
appreciate you. Cherish your spouses. Think, think of how special they are. It's an opportunity. Strengthen the bonds between each other, between within the family and outside of. Think of others. Step outside of ourselves. That would be a zuchus. That's there's no bigger zuchus in Shemaim Faster than that. Yigdal Moshe, the pasuk says, Moshe became a godel. Vayetze el echov went out to his brothers. He's the prince of Egypt. He lived in the lap of luxury. Says Rashi, Nosan Einov veliboy lihios mitzta'ir halehem. He chose to put Einov veliboy, his intellect, his perception, and his heart share just to be there for them. Let's just be there for each other this Shabbos. Let's sing together. Let's enjoy Shabbos together. Enjoy Shabbos meals together. Daven together. Learn together. That's what we do. That's the Kehila. Kehilas Yaakov. Kol Kahal Adas Yisrael. Wish you all a good Shabbos. Shaloisa Hitzara V'yogoin V'anocha B'yemenu Chaseinu And I look forward to being with you. May we all have a peaceful, calm, Lechtigen Shabbos. Shabbos.